Oh, 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 oh. Trying to help. get me cancelled. So here's my point of view. My point of view is that my family really mattered most to me. So I started to research happiness and eventually became what you see today. Someone who worked at the highest levels of innovation in tech with being chief business officer of Google X. And I stopped. I didn't accept that this was going to be the way I made money. Today, I want to be a billionaire by the end of my life, but not a, a dollar billionaire. My mission is one billion happy, so I'm trying to get, hopefully, a billion people to listen to a message that reminds them that happiness is their birthright. If you value me for what I wear, then you're probably not a person that I care about that much at all. And you're shamed when you don't have nice things. Yeah, good for you. I think you'll be shaming yourself when you're 56 like I am and haven't spent enough time with your family. Most of us who have made it all the way to wealth will look back and say none of it mattered at all. A hug from someone that you loved did. My son left our world due to medical malpractice, right? Some surgeon, you know, made a mistake, five mistakes. And my 21-year-old, handsome, beautiful, wise young man, who I considered my son and my best friend, left the world. I can take that one thought and be the victim for the rest of my life. It's a choice. Or I can tell myself it's not going to bring him back. Mo. Hello, hello. Welcome to Millennial Mind. Well, actually, thank you for having me in your studio. And thank you for the wonderful day we've spent together already. It's amazing. You're a wonderful person. Thank I'm you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so grateful to have this conversation with you. and. We spent so much time together already that I want to break down so many things that I don't know about you, but also give that value to my audience. Every video I find on you is talking around happiness, grief, or how AI is ruining our lives. <laughs> yes. And, and so, stress. And stress. Yeah. So before we dive into those topics, I actually just want to know about you. Tell me, mm. where were you born? How did you take over the world? Take over the world? <laughs> Uh, I, I was born in the wrong place, if you think about it, uh, for the talents I was given. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, I was a mathematician mainly at heart, a computer scientist, if you want, from age eight, uh, when the talents that my friends would have appreciated were football. Mm -hmm. uh, which wasn't really my... I mean, I was okay. I was a good goalie, actually. But, uh, but you know, it wasn't the topic that I would spend every week watching the games to, to discuss. Uh, I went to a, an amazing, amazing uh, primary school uh, where I really learned a lot about learning. And then I went to public school and then public university in Egypt. Uh, which I would probably say did not satisfy my hunger for knowledge and learning. But I, you know, again, with, with, the, with, the, with the skills I learned from primary school, I think I managed to learn a little more than they wanted me to, if you mm. think about it. And then, uh, yeah, life uh, started to give me opportunities after opportunities. So I went to uh, IBM, which at the time was definitely the job to dream of in Egypt. But also for me, it was the job to uh, to learn because IBM really invested in its people. And so at the time, I, you know, for the first several weeks at the job, they wouldn't let us meet customers until we've gone through certain trainings. And, you know, I had very, you know, amazing mentors, to be honest, and learned everything I know about business at IBM, mm -hmm. then sort of went through life. Uh, cashing on, in on that. So I worked at Microsoft and then I worked at Google to very senior levels. Uh, yeah, that's uh, my, my professional career. And on the other side, I was uh, blessed with a lovely, lovely, lovely woman that has a horrible taste in men that accepted me. And uh, basically she was called my college sweetheart. Uh, then we got married and together we started a family. Uh, two wonderful kids and uh, and uh, yeah I was given everything really when you think about it mm -hmm. and I wasn't very happy as most most of my followers will know uh, which is not unusual by the way for those who succeed early in life and yeah for me it just was 
a wake up moment i think when i uh, when i started to recognize that my unhappiness was hurting my family and you know that my family really mattered most to me so i started to research happiness and eventually became what you see today someone who is a bit of the technology mm -hmm. you know i've i've worked at the highest levels of of you know innovation in tech with being chief business officer of google x so I have a very, very clear view of how dangerous and unregulated, not unregulated, but, um, you know, unethical AI might be. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think regulation is the path to unethical AI, but an unethical AI might be a very di serious danger to us uh, humans. And then at the same time, I spend most of my time talking about what I have gone through being a successful but, but unhappy Mm -hmm. You know, what my dad went through being successful but extremely stressed. And these are my really, really my main targets in life. Even as I talk about artificial intelligence, I talk about it from a point of view that hopefully will enable human happiness and human prosperity. How do you define success? Today, very differently than I did when I was young. And, you know, I don't see any blame for anyone who wakes up uh, after university or after school and, and says, you know, I'm going to be a millionaire and I'm going to be a billionaire and I'm going to ha to build a unicorn and so on. It's, it's basically what people, uh, we do what we're told uh, makes us fit in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did that. I mean, I, there were times in my life where all I wanted was to make money. Uh, and I did very well. I mean, I was a mathematician by definition. Um, you know, by uh, by uh, training, I was you know at least my my own personal training. I was a software developer, so way before all of the noise of online trading that we have today was ex even existent. I wrote my own code, and I could trade online in ways that printed money on demand. And you know, I'll be very open and honest. If you're trading online, you're really not building anyone's economy. You're not helping anyone out. You're just trying to make money. And it's a very big casino. We all go and we all say, okay, if I'm mathematically more adept than the next guy, then mm -hmm. I will take money, they will pay it. And it's just an exchange of wealth, really. And to my early self, that was okay. To mm -hmm. my later self in life, I realized that I was taking the money of the old lady's pension, basically. And, uh, and I stopped. Uh, I didn't accept that this was going to be the way I made money. Uh, today, I want to be a billionaire by the end of my life, but not a, a dollar billionaire. My mission is one billion happy, so I'm trying to get, hopefully, a billion people to listen to a message that reminds them that happiness is their birthright. It's interesting you talk around this switch, because I often feel that, and I, and I ask Stephen the same question, when people have that wealth, only then do they say you don't need to chase it. So I what run I'm, away from it, actually for some of us. Why? So the statistics will show you that money makes you happier as long as you're below the average income of the country you live in. Uh, so of course, if you can't make ends meet, you can't put food on the table, mm -hmm. it's hard to find happiness. But the minute your basic needs are met, basic needs, mm -hmm. uh, money then is only used to buy you toys, buy you ego. And at the same time, it takes away your peace of mind because when you have money, you want more money. It doesn't mm -hmm. become a question of, do I need my needs met anymore? It becomes a question of, can I appear better than the next guy than ha that has money? And, and you know, in my, in my personal experience, it was quite eye-opening because when I made money at the beginning, you first, uh, you know, l l let, me, let me say this, you are born happy, okay? We're mm -hmm. all, our innate nature is happiness. So, so if, you, if you take a little child and that little child is fed and safe and loved and nobody's screaming next to them, no, no reason for unhappiness. The nature of humanity is calm and peaceful contentment. You look at the ceiling, you play with your toes and you giggle, right? That's our nature. Mm -hmm. and, and then to, to succeed, uh, you have to do certain things that lead you to success. And that's not a reason for unhappiness, but if those things are causing you unhappiness, they're causing you stress, they're making you compare yourself to others, they're making you uh, feel that you're, you know, you, you, there is more to, uh, to, to, to gain, but you haven't gained it yet, to, to ma that make you, they make you feel that you made a mistake or two here that you need to correct and so on and so forth, 
by giving reasons for unhappiness, unhappiness starts to arise within us. Mm. Okay, and and you know the more the, the more money you bring, the more reasons for unhappiness you start to feel. So you start to get ego, for example. I I know many uh, friends who are billionaires, multi billionaires. And, you know, I've trained many, many million billionaires and, you know, high net worth individuals on happiness and stress and so on. Somehow banks love to give me as a gift to their clients. Uh, and and, and I, I believe everyone has the right to be happy. So I don't discriminate in that mm. way if you think about it. But, uh, but the truth is uh, they're the unhappiest people on earth because uh, I think it was in Stephen Bartlett's book, Happy Sexy, Sexy Millionaire, that there was a study where they uh, asked people, how happy are you out of 10 on a scale of one to 10? And then they asked them, how much more money would you need to get to 10? Mm -hmm. And it, does, it didn't matter where on the scale you were. If you were earning 5,000 a, a, a year, 50,000 a year or 5 billion a year, mm -hmm. every one of the participants said double. Give, give me double what I have and I'll be happy. Okay. And it's quite interesting because when you ask someone who's earning 50, double to them is 50 more and I'll be 10, 10 out of 10. Mm. Uh, you know, you must expect that the guy that has now 5 billion uh, at a point in time was also at the 50 and said, give me double and I will be okay, mm. right? And the truth is, it never ends. As a matter of fact, in my own personal experience, the more money you have beyond a certain point. So ha money brings you happiness for as long as you don't have your needs met. Once needs are met, you start to just spend it on toys that sometimes give you a, a short jolt of happiness, sometimes don't make you happy at all. So your happiness plateaus. Yeah. And then at a certain point when wealth continues to increase, your happiness starts to dip mm -hmm. because people start to treat you differently. Everyone wants a piece of you. Uh, you know, you, you constantly blame yourself for not investing the money properly. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to protect it? Yeah. And, and so on. Right. And, uh, and, and, and the world becomes different. You lose that human connection and human element that makes you who you are and you just become a bank, mm. basically. And I've seen that quite frequently among, you know, among people. So does money make us happy? It does when you give it away. Uh, that's been my personal experience. And there was a point in time after losing my son where I decided r in reality, how much do I need? And, you know, Google's been very generous to me and I gave the rest away. Mm. And, and I still do give the majority of what I earn away. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, I, I don't say that to brag. Of all, course. But I say that to, to, to tell people that by, by becoming the minimalist that I am, um, I own money, but money doesn't own me. Mm. Do you know the difference? The difference is I have what I need. Yes. My $12 t-shirt now I've upgraded. Okay, my same jeans, I have three pairs of jeans for the last year. Okay, my same Converse, I, 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 I have two of them that I change between and, you know, a pair of shoes for the gym. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, honestly, if I just tell you the number of hours that I save thinking about what I'm going to wear and, you know, um, you ladies think <laughs> about what makeup and, you know, which shoes and all of that, I don't think of any of that. Mm -hmm. I wake up in the morning, it's a black, black t-shirt and a pair of jeans. And, you know, in my mind, yes, that will probably get around 10, 15% of humans to not, to think of me as, you know, a, a hobo of some sort. And I think that's great because I don't want to be with those 10% of people. Of course. And, and the rest is fine. My, the rest of my life is easy. I don't, I don't think about those things. I don't think about... What will they think of me if I'm driving a, spe a specific car? I don't think about, you know, what will they think of me if I show up at a wedding in my T-shirt? Do you, you know? do that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, 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 uh, in, uh, in respect. I mean, remember, I will, I will tell the, the, the bride or the groom beforehand, look, I'd love to come and celebrate with you. I just don't own a suit. Is that okay? And, you know, some of them will say, rent a suit. And I'll say, it just doesn't look well on me. And then we will agree. Either they want the suit or they want me. If they want me, I'll come in my T-shirt. So funny. It's, I love that, though. It is. It's Being sure in who you are, though. I, th I think, it, I think it's a, big, a, a bit of a trauma from my younger age, if you think about it. Is that if you value me for what I wear, then you're probably not a person that I care about that mm. much at all. Okay. 
if you're not if you're unable to look beyond what I wear or the way I look or my haircut I mean very stylish uh, you know if you're not able to look beyond that then yeah. yes amazing I respect you there are you have your tribe but yeah. you're not part of mine so people who are listening and watching this are gonna think okay so when you have to go to a job interview or you have to speak at an event or when Google you worked at Google did you just wear a t-shirt yeah, I very, very, very rarely went to to very important like head of state or a prime minister's meeting mm. uh, in a suit. Uh, but I normally actually saw one of my biggest tricks because I, you know, I'm an old man. I had relationships in with my clients for many, many, many years. So all, many of them I knew uh, firsthand and personally, including, you know, including prime ministers and CEOs and yeah. so on. Uh, and I would always text first and say, hey, do you want me to, to come in a suit or do you want me to come as a friend? Okay. And actually, I had government co uh, you know, clients over the years where I would go first in a jacket and, and, <laughs> you know, and, I w and they'd go like, aren't you, uh, aren't you always wearing a T-shirt? Why are you wearing a jacket today? And I would say, I just didn't feel safe. When we're good friends, I'll come in my T-shirt. How and, interesting. And believe it or not, the day I showed up in my T-shirt, they celebrated. It was like, yeah, finally, finally, now mm. we can, you know, we know each other as humans. Th there is, it's, it's not, but by the way, my, my look is also a form of ego. Huh? Let's, let's not deny that. Huh? It is a form of ego to, to say I don't care. Yes. Right? And, and there will always be ego. There, you will always, whatever it is that you do in life, you will associate with something. Ego is not, is not only arrogance. So you can, your ego might tell you I'm better than others, but it mm -hmm. also might tell you I'm l worse than others. It also might tell you I'm a victim. It also might tell you I deserve to be unhappy. All of these are forms of ego. Mm -hmm. And ego is a way that you define yourself and show up in the world with, right? And, and there is no way as a human you can actually live without that uh, hunger for being identified, uh, you know, if you, if you want as an individual. The, the only difference is that you, your ego can own you or you can own your ego. Mm. There is a utility to ego. Yeah. Okay? And the utility is I want people to come my way that are simple, that are interested in intellectual conversations that, you know, sometimes when I wear a Pink Floyd T-shirt, I want people to come and talk to me who like Pink Floyd. There is an, mm. a, a utility to that ego. Yes. Right. If, however, I am a slave to that ego in a, in, a, in a way where if people looked at me and said, no, he's not what he's pretending to be, I would feel angry or insecure or, you know, or, 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 or not good enough or whatever, then my ego owns me. Mm. Okay. And, you know, there was that fable of, uh, uh, of someone that goes to his teacher and, uh, you know, uh, his teacher is sitting on that little rug in the middle of the temple and, and he says, Tell, teach me the, re, you know, the secret to happiness. And, and the, the teacher says, no, I'm not the best at that. You should go to my teacher and he will teach you the secret to happiness. And so he goes to his teacher and his teacher is living in a palace. Everything's made of gold and marble everywhere. And, you know, everything around is luxury and mm. expensive and so on. But the teacher refuses to meet him. Okay. So, so he goes down back to his own teacher and says, what are you telling me? Is, is wealth, is all of that luxury the secret to happiness? And he said, no, my teacher owns everything in life. But if it all is lost tomorrow, he wouldn't even blink. I only own this rug. And if you took it away from me, I would kill myself. Okay. And in a very interesting way, that truly is the secret to navigating life is to own all of life, but not let any of life own you. Okay, is to have friends in your life that you love and connect to, but respect that they have their own lives and they can be away and they can, you know, mm. to have a partner in your life that, y you know, you feel affection to, uh, but to allow them to be free to explore their own life, to, to have money, but not really need money, not tell yourself that I'm so dependent on money. You know what I mean? To, to have, uh, uh, if you want a fancy car, you can drive a fancy car if you want to, but if you if you sit in that car with the objective of people looking at you and saying he's successful or she's successful then you failed yeah because there, there will always be someone with a fancier car who will look at you and say yours is rubbish yours is rubbish and then suddenly you're broken even though you you love that car 
-hmm. right? You, it, it, the whole idea is can you own it and not let it own you? That's, that's the game. There's a lot of people who have a difficult relationship with money and also relationships and all of those things we've just discussed. How do you let that go? How do you start to learn to appreciate things but not allow them to take over and control you? There are many lessons around money. Uh, my, one of my first lessons was the, uh, the, 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 the understanding of the difference between wealth and financial independence or time independence as they time sometimes call it and, and money uh, as wealth is an endless pit so you will never reach a state of wealth because as i told you my my billionaire clients or friends uh, who are sitting on their uh, four thousand foot yacht are looking at the other guy who has a four thousand one hundred foot yacht and saying what's wrong with me Okay. Really? Yeah, and, and the difference between, I don't know how big yachts are, yeah. but let's say 100 foot or whatever. The, di the difference in price between 100 foot and 110, I'm just making yeah, those yeah. numbers up, is the, diff is the reason why everyone says, I want to double uh, my income. Right? So, so if, if you have a billion dollars and you're able to build uh, an amazing home that is, you know, uh, $200 million worth, mm -hmm. and your neighbor has $2 million dollars, uh, so two billion dollars and, and builds a home that's 400 million dollars worth there is practically no difference between the two uh, but you still want to compete because of ego yes okay uh, now when i was young in my early 30s late 20s uh, when so much money was coming in i started to tell myself you know let me pour money on my unhappiness and see if it works okay, okay? vacations fancy cars believe it or not i did i even i bought fancy suits and you know uh, expensive watches and pens like people pay ridiculous amounts of money for pens that you so can funny that is yeah anyway and i did that all of that okay hmm? uh, and and it didn't bring me any happiness at all as a matter of fact it made me more miserable and, and I, at the time, I started to tell myself, uh, why is it making me miserable? One is ego is never satisfied. Mm. But the other is to keep that lifestyle. I had to go to work every single day. And sometimes I didn't enjoy work very much. Yeah. And sometimes when, you know, one year I closed 130% of my target and I made a lot of money. The next year I closed 105 and didn't make as much money. I would start to feel poor. Like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Right? Because poor, poor as compared to what? As compared to the demands that my wealth put on me. Mm. Right. And I read a book at the time. It was... Uh, Kawasaki, I don't remember his first name, the rich man, rich dad, poor dad. Poor dad, rich dad, yeah. yeah. Rich yeah. dad, poor dad, uh, Robert, yeah. Robert Kawasaki, Robert, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, he, uh, and he wrote the second book he wrote was called The Cash Flow Quadrants, which I think was a very big eye opener for me because it spoke about financial independence. Okay. And, you know, he defined financial independence not as a function of how much money you have in the bank, but basically how much money comes in as compared to how much money goes out. Okay. Okay. And a big part of how much money goes out is the choice of your lifestyle. Correct. You know, I, I wear $12 t-shirts. I buy around 11 of them every year. And, uh, you know, you really don't need a big job or a big income to live that way. No. Okay? Those, th I have three uh, pairs of jeans. I only changed one this year. The other two are in perfect shape. Uh, and I'm not... I'm not unkind to myself or the people that I love. Okay? Yes. I just choose a lifestyle that allows me to, to, to spend only on what I believe is worthy of my spend. Okay? And once you balance the income and the cost, some, at a point in your life, you know, I have intellectual property in my books, mm. I have you know, intellectual pro property in my membership, I have this, I have that. I'm definitely, by any definition of anyone that lives here in London, not that, exp not, not that uh, rich, believe it or not, in terms of my income, but compared to my expenses, I am a very happy man, mm. right? And when your passive income increases above your uh, expenses, you're rich perpetually for the rest of your life, Yeah. right? All of your needs are met without the need to work for the rest of your life, okay? And that's a very interesting point. So, so to me, this is the very first correction in terms of the relationship with money that people need to have is to ask yourself 
are you interested to work your ass off to buy another more expensive car or to buy an, an expensive car in the first place? Or are you interested to live a life that gives you everything that you need that allows your people, the people that you love to live a, a, a good life that allows them to develop and grow? And be, beyond that, instead of investing your most valuable asset, which is your time, to get a less valuable asset that's called money that is spent on even a less valuable asset that's called toys or ego that never really makes you happy, would you actually make that choice and say, hold on, I have everything that I need. I'm going to live that way and enjoy my time with the people that I love and the things that I enjoy. I don't think people would say yes. I, I, don't, I think most people will not say yes to that. Yes, for sure. Yeah. And a lot of people would say... I've heard someone say this, it's just lazy then, isn't it? Because we all don't actually need very much. A lot of us could survive on a minimal salary a year if we wanted to, but people don't want to. And you're shamed when you don't have nice things. Yeah, good for you. I think you'll be shaming yourself when you're 56 like I am and <laughs> haven't spent enough time with your family. Mm. I think you'll be shaming yourself when you are... 56 like I am and haven't spent enough time reflecting on the stuff that actually matters in life mm -hmm. I think it will you'll, 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 you'll shame yourself when you when you look back at the rest uh, You know at the past life that you were given and actually Find that you didn't enjoy the amount of love that you deserved. Yeah, because you were out there What loving a copy machine a copying machine or a printer or a you know a laptop or a, a, a little iPhone mm -hmm. right and I think that's you know, it's a choice. Every human can make that choice. Uh, but as you said at the beginning, most of us who have made it all the way yes. to wealth will look back and say, none of it mattered at all. A hug from someone that you loved did. Uh, and, and yeah, and sadly, a lot of people will eventually tell you, oh, but I needed to try it for myself. Yes. And I don't blame them. Try it for yourself. But when you figure it out, tell others, because maybe you'll save someone's 10, 20 years of misery. Do you think happiness is a choice? 100%. Why? Well, pain in life isn't. L life is supposed to send you some harshness and difficulties and challenges. That's not a choice, right? But if your partner says something hurtful on Friday, that's the pain. You bring it up, bringing it up again on Saturday and adding drama to it on Sunday and telling yourself that you're not worthy on Tuesday, mm -hmm. that's a choice. Mm -hmm. Okay, you you not doing anything about it to solve it. That's a choice you uh, you know uh, Assuming the utility of unhappiness, which is uh, telling all of your friends so that they tap you on the back and say Oh poor girl. I'm really, I'm really sorry that he said that Okay, that's a choice mm -hmm. waking up in the morning and watching the morning news Which brings you 99% of news that you don't you have no control over whatsoever yeah. But makes you miserable. That's a choice. Watching a horror movie and thinking that the world is unsafe. That's a choice. But there's going to be people watching this or listening to this saying, you have no idea how it feels. Someone in my family has died. I've been sexually assaulted. The worst possible thing could have, uh, m that you can imagine has happened to me. How can you say that me being unhappy is not a choice? Be being happier, less unhappy is a choice. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm really sorry for your loss. I lost someone I love very much too. I'm really sorry for the harshness of your life. You know, it's, it's appalling how sometimes life is. Yeah. But you can still live in that moment for the rest of your life. Or you can make a, a small step to be a tiny bit happier every day. Okay, I had a, uh, when I taught Solve for Happy, my first book, before, way before COVID, 2017, 2018, I used to teach, uh, you know, workshops and I taught around 20,000 people perhaps in person. And I remember vividly, uh, um, I, I, was, I had a workshop that had like a couple of thousand people. And, you know, at the beginning, I attempted to discuss that the events of your life don't make you unhappy. It's the thought about them that makes you unhappy. If the event is over, Mm. then the only way you can bring it back to life is to think about it. And I had a lovely, lovely, lovely old lady uh, walk to me slowly but angrily uh, after that session in the first break and literally push the people that were talking to me away and stand in front of me and, and, and tell me, 
what are you talking about? You have no idea what I have been through when I was 17. Okay. She was 78. Wow. Yeah. So I cried. I hugged her. Mm. And I said, 61 years. Mm. Did it work? With all of the thinking, all of the, you know, the, the anger, all of the resentment, all of the grudge that you held, all of the victimhood, whatever it is that we choose, each of us chooses differently to look at that one event, one, mm -hmm. okay, and stick with it. So true. Did it work? I said. And so she cried hmm? and said, no, I'm still miserable. Okay. And I asked her and I said, were there other moments in your life in the last 61 years hmm, that could have made you happy? And she cried more. She said, so many. So many that came to my life and wanted to love me, but I was miserable and I, you know, pushed them away. So many uh, moments of silence and joy where there was nature around me and laughter around me and music around me. And I chose to sit in my corner and think about what happened to me when I was 17. Yeah. Right? And I don't blame her. No. I don't. But I wonder if that's the best path through life. Because if something happened in the past, the only way you can give it life is to take it into your, your head, turn it into a thought, and give it life again. Right? Okay. If something has not happened and you're concerned about it in the future, hmm, it's not part of life. You can mm -hmm. only turn it into life by taking it into your head turning it into a thought and give it, giving it en the energy it needs to live, right? And that's a choice. My son left our world due to medical malpractice, right? Some surgeon, you know, made a mistake, five mistakes. And my 21-year-old, handsome, beautiful, wise young man, uh, who I co considered my son and my best friend, left the world, mm. right? And I can... I can take that one thought and be the victim for the rest of my life. It's a choice. Okay? Or I can tell myself it's not going to bring him back. It's not going to bring him back. I can do something different that would make his life, uh, you know, remembered, his eth essence would live on. Yeah. And my life and the life of those who interact with me would become better as a result. One it's of the choice. things about that that stood out to me is you said acceptance is the last part of grief. And acceptance is what's going to keep you moving forward. But when you lose someone, you know, like you did, when it wasn't expected, or generally if you lose someone and you weren't ready to let them go. Are we ever ready, ready to let them go? I think so. No. You don't think so? No, I always, I always wondered in my heart if, if I had a, a back door to the universe's secret or to God, mm -hmm. okay? And I went and the businessman that I am, I managed to negotiate and said, give me five more days. Yeah. Oh, that's never enough. Yeah. I mean, if they've been ill for a long time and then you're ready to let them go because they're Why very then? old and suffering. Why then do we let them go? Because you've accepted that they've lived a good life mm -hmm. and they're happy mm -hmm. and now they're suffering and you don't mm -hmm. want to see them suffer too much. Even though you, the way you look at someone is by looking at their body watching them suffer is too painful okay so ali uh, lived a very good life mm -hmm. okay and he was happy yeah and the question of was he suffering or not is not the question the mm. question is is he suffering there yes because the definition so so my son before he left our world lived in uh, boston okay he was studying and he was very curious and he loved what he was studying and he had good friends and he had his band and life was amazing mm -hmm. But being 21 and me being a man meant that we spoke once every two weeks. Okay. We texted two, three times a week. Normally a very short joke. Okay. And I was the happiest person on earth because I knew my son was okay. Mm. I knew my son was okay. Now, the question is now that my son de detached from his physical form and his physical form decayed, does that not make him okay? And I think that's one of the biggest challenges we have in the Western world. Okay. In the Western world, because we associate so much with the scientific method, we believe that when we die, there is nothingness. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that's a myth of the scientific method. Why? Because the scientific method 
somehow is taught to us as if I cannot observe it and measure it repeatedly with physical instruments, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. But love exists. Trust exists. Consciousness exists. Uh, uh, compassion exists. A million things existed, including germs and viruses that we couldn't measure with our instruments at the time. Yeah. Light exists and, uh, you know, a, 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 um, a worm cannot see it because it can only, you know, sense uh, uh, taste and touch. That's the only two senses it, it has. There is so much that exists. That we don't know. That we can't measure in the physical world, mm. right? And life itself has never been measured at all. Mm -hmm. we, we don't know how to measure life. Now, when you, when you look at it this way, you realize that the scientific method was a little arrogant when it said it didn't exist. It just said, it sh they should have said, if it is, if I can't measure it, yes. if I can't observe it and measure it repeatedly with physical instruments, it's not a concern of science. That's, that's humbleness. It's not a concern of science. It's not a topic that science should debate. Yeah. Okay. But then there is spirituality, there is philosophy, there are other disciplines that can look at that topic and say, what makes sense here? Mm -hmm. Does it make sense that when our bodies decay, our life ends, right? Does that by definition mean that our consciousness was a physical property of ours? How come then you are conscious of your dreams, mm. right? More interestingly, uh, you know, if you go back to science itself and say, all right, so if, by the way, nothing exists as per the, uh, you know, uncertainty principle of quantum physics until it's observed by a form of life. Yeah. Does that make life physical? Because life is what observes the physical. Mm. Right. And, and, you know, I, I don't, I'm, I don't try to change people's minds on this, but I'm, I try to say that death is not the opposite of life. What is that? Death is the opposite of birth. You're a video gamer like me. You would know that the level of the game starts when, you know, you switch on the console and then there is that little period of blackness and then you start the game. Mm -hmm. And this level of the game ends hmm, when there is a little bit of blackness on the screen and then you play the next level. Yeah. Right? You, as the player, existed before the console was switched on and after the console is switched off. Life. Yeah exists before, during, and after this physical experience. You talk about Ali being with you. All the time. And he sends you signals. All the time. Talk to me about that. <sighs> Why are we talking about those things? Um, you're psychic, you know that. <laughs> do you? No. You do. On my podcast, you spoke about it. Mm -hmm. okay. I, have, I have intuition where I sometimes have Good. strong feelings. Yes. Tell me more. I one example. You. Oh, you want me to tell you? You actually want me to tell you? Yeah. Okay. Many times, I, when my grandma died, I felt her within me. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you a story. When she died, I was there. And I was only 17. And so for the next three days, I had dreams where she would die in the bathtub, where she used to bathe me when I was a kid, where she would die on the sofa, and where she would die in her bedroom. And in the last dream, she said go into my room and get the shawl. And I said, okay, I don't remember. I woke up in the morning and I told my mom. I said, Nanny told me to get the shawl. It was white, I've never seen it before. It had this red and green pattern. And so if you go there, can you get it? Because I didn't want to go to the house. I think it was three months later when my mom was emptying the house. The shawl was in the exact place she told me in my dream. Correct. Interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So there was a study by the CIA, by, um uh, well, the CIA, yeah. Uh, you know what remote viewing is? No. Remote viewing is what you see in, uh, in sitcoms and movies where they get a psychic and they give them a, you know, um, a bracelet of someone that's kidnapped and say, can you tell us where that person is? And okay. they will close their eyes and, you know, with uh, the drama of the movies, <laughs> you know, say, oh, I see a uh, hut and the hut yeah, is yeah. next to a palm tree, right? Yeah. Yeah, so the CIA did a study on 50 randomly chosen officers, mm -hmm. randomly chosen, okay? Uh, there is a technique, if you want to read about it, there is a good book called My Big Toe. 
Okay. And, uh, you know, and they taught them that meditation technique. There are even meditation techniques for remote viewing available on YouTube. And they taught them that technique. And guess how many managed to be able to see across space? 100% of the 50, every single one of them was able to see across space. How? We humans are made of pure consciousness and awareness. Mm -hmm. That's what we are. Mm -hmm. Okay. The only, do you know what a savant syndrome is? You know, those, no. those, those highly, uh, Rain, Rain Man, for example, is an example of that. Rain Man can read, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but something like 18 pages a minute or something like that. It's scary, scary fast. Uh, reading two pages at the same time, one with the left eye and one with the right eye, and memorizing every single word on every book he's ever read. So you would go and ask him, you know, in Encyclopedia Britannica, page number 17 on volume 60, whatever, and he will tell you line three, third word, this. Mm. Okay? Uh, and, and there were lots of studies on savant syndromes. Uh, you know, these are highly intelligent people, highly capable in certain skills and extremely incapable in other skills. So, so their social skills, for example, wouldn't be that adept. And, uh, and, and, you know, it puzzled us for a, for a while, how can someone have that enormous memory capacity or enormous photographic memory and so on, until we started to study those who become savants later in life. Mm -hmm. So a very, a very interesting example, if you go to YouTube, you'll probably find a bit of a documentary called Beautiful Minds with an okay. S. Uh, and this, this, there is this, you know, not so educated man uh, working, you know, so, sort of in a fast, you know, sort of, you know, like a, a restaurant of some sort, fast food restaurant. And then he gets hit with a baseball that disables certain, spa certain parts of his brain. Okay. Okay. And, and as that happens, he starts to develop a, an ability to draw everything he sees to a high, very high level of accuracy. And in the documentary, they fly him in a helicopter for one hour on top of Rome. He's mm -hmm. never seen Rome before. Then put him in a room with one sheet of paper, one meter high by, say, eight meters long, curved. And he starts to draw like a plotter in front of the camera. Everything that he's seen, including which traffic light was red, which human was crossing, which traffic uh, crossing, uh, you know, to literally as if he take, took a photo of it. Wow. Induced by a hit that disabled mm -hmm. part of the brain. It's our brains by definition are capable of so much more than what we think we are capable of. We just inhibit them, right? We have filters because to function in the modern world, you need to filter what you don't need to process at the time. If you're crossing the street, hmm, you don't listen to the birds anymore. And if there is a fast car approaching, you don't see the cute person on the other side of the street. Yeah. Right. Why? Because you filter that information because it's not necessary for your survival. And as we are born, hmm, most of us are super imaginative, super creative, super fun, always happy, very playful and psychic. Mm. OK. And then you, you start to filter yourself out of those. One of my favorite humans on the planet is my very dear friend, Dr. Jill Balti Taylor. Uh, and Jill uh, is a neuroscientist that had a stroke this, that disabled her left brain. And you have to listen to her talk, talk as she describes hmm, how she saw the world with her left hemisphere deactivated and her right hemisphere working. It's, a, it's the most beautiful psychedelic trip of compassion and, wow. and, and connection. And you know, she, she basically says, I couldn't see the, 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 the edge between where my hand ended and where the, where the wall began. It was all one. Everything was one. Okay? I felt like one with the whole universe. Hmm? These are within us, but we function in a way that is enabling our filters so that our filters inhibit us mm -hmm. from learning those things as we should or performing those things that, as we should. And, and I am to blame as anyone else as I rush around the world and speak about my work and, you know, attempt to, to get people to, uh, to my mission, One Billion Happy and so on. Yeah, perhaps if I could uh, sit back and, you know, give myself the time and the openness to learn and, and to, you know, to see more of my potential, maybe I'm one of the X-Men. I don't know.
A lot of us forget this, but nutrition can actually play a really important part in helping us manage our mental health. The foods you eat impact the structure and function of your brain, playing a major role in emotional regulation and cognitive function. A really quick way that I support and supplement my diet is by drinking a protein shake from Form. It's totally vegan, has 30 grams of protein, and it tastes amazing with water, which I make in the shaker here after the gym. It's also got a complete amino acid profile per serving, and amino acids actually help produce key neurotransmitters, which support and prevent things like depression and treating anxiety. It also helps you to improve your energy levels so that you're keeping strong so you can keep active every single day. So if you're struggling with low mood, if you're struggling with burnout, it could actually be a really quick and easy win for you to incorporate some more protein, some more nutrients, and some more minerals into your diet. They have so many different flavors and you can actually get 10% off all of their flavors by tapping the link in this description and by using my code AMM10. I genuinely love Form. It's such an honor to work with a brand that you love and I really can't wait for you all to try their different flavors so that you can incorporate more protein into your diet too. Back to the episode. How interesting. My question was around uh, how you hear him. So he talks to me in mathematics and music. So we, uh, when he, the, the, the day he died, uh, I had a very unusual, uh, unusually happy tune in my head. Really? Very happy, okay? And, uh, and it just kept playing over and over and over and over and over and over to the point where I'm like openly telling my brain, your son just died, can you please? You know, I, I thought I'm hallucinating. And it took me uh, four days. I don't remember exactly, but let's say four days until I suddenly remembered that I only heard that tune once in my life on a concert that I went to with Ali uh, that was called Video Games Life. Wow. And that tune was the credits song of a game we used to play together that's called Portal. And, uh, and so it just hit me very quickly that this is the theme song of Portal. So I went and played it. It's called Still Alive. Mm-hmm. So if people want to search for it, it's called Still Alive, the Portal theme song. And oh my God, it was my son talking to me openly, openly saying, I'm okay. Everything's fine. I'm still alive. Wow. Right. And, you know, if you know my son well, you would, you would get some of the words in there that sound so much like him. I don't know if he sounded that way in life because he listened to songs like that or yeah. if that song, in the absence of space-time as we know it, may have been influenced by, you know, he might have sort of nudged the spirit of the, author, of the, of the lyri- lyricist of that song and said, hey, can you just insert a couple of words here for me? I don't know, right? Yeah. But it made so much sense for me. Ali, on 14th of January 2020, on his birthday, uh, seven years after he died, uh, six years after he died, he said, there is a plague coming, right? And, you know, uh, that was the time when he, you know, he basically, so I, I texted, I can, I can show you the texts, I texted my coach, and I said, Ali just tell, told me there is a plague coming, what do I do? And she said, I have no idea, well, let's wait. You're joking. I'm not joking at all. Wow. Right? Ali, before he died, he left us several messages, um, you know, that basically meant he knew he was dying. Many who who are comfortable with themselves before they die, they they say, you know, 40 days before you sort of know that you're packing, basically. Uh, I have heard that. Yeah. But, you know, I don't want to, I'm a scientist. Yeah. Understand? Yes. Love exists. Mm. I can't prove it. Okay, but but I get very clear messages from my son. And yeah, if you ask me for scientific evidence, I can't prove it. Mm. Right. But so is the idea of remote viewing. Mm. When you when you instruct 50 people uh, from the CIA to try it and show them how they can do it. Can we prove that scientifically? Who knows? No. When you talk about Ali and you talk around that process, everything I've heard you say around him is very unusual from, from different angles. The first is how you say your son was so wise. 
He was very wise. And how you learned so much from him when he was eight, 11, 21. At every stage of his life, you, in so many videos, you've said, I learned so much from him. He taught me so much. A lot of parents don't say that about their children. Yeah, they're stupid. <laughs> Honestly. I mean, Ali was extra wise. But you have to understand, if we as humans come to this world happy and then become unhappy, mm -hmm. then our instinct, our, our nature, our human nature is very much enlightened. Interestingly, we come to this world happy, playful, creative, yeah. wonderful traits, connected, okay? We don't have any gender, gender identity. We don't think of the other guy as the enemy. Mm. Uh, you know, behaviorism in, in, in psychology will tell you that we don't even know, de define good and bad. Yeah. So if you show a, a white rat to a, to a child, the child has no association whatsoever. And that was the, the criminal, almost criminal experiments that were done in the, in the 1920s around behaviorism, which was to show the, the child a, a snake or a rat or a, or a you know, um, a, a puppy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can take the cutest puppy and turn it into incredible fear by playing a very loud sound behind the, the child's head. Wow. And the child would be conditioned for the rest of their life to fear puppies, but not snakes. Right? How interesting. And, and, and that's how we are as humans. Now, when you realize that, you realize that we're closer to our nature of enlightenment as children than we are as conditioned humans that are battling it out in the real world. And believe it or not, a lot of the spiritual teachers that have taught me and that I have admired will tell you that the whole mission is to go back to your childlike nature. That, you know, I had the, the honor and the joy of spending time with some of the most senior monks in the world, mm. Mm. Uh, you know, including, for example, the Dalai Lama, and, mm. and, and they are kids, truly mm. and honestly. They are not ashamed of it, they're proud of it, they're serious when they need to, Yeah. right? But they have that childlike openness to life. I, I now, uh, you know, I think I'm more and more kiddish, you probably shouldn't take me seriously at all, but I have that nature of flow with life. Like, I don't expect life to behave in any specific way at all. I just yeah. take what life gives me and I enjoy the hell out of it. Okay? Mm. And yes, I engage and I make a difference and, you know, I make money and uh, all of that stuff. But yeah. not, not with that um, um, harshness of what they teach you with in school. I, I, I do it with flow and fun and joy, like a video gamer, as if I'm... You know, I'm, I'm, I, I, oh, this is a millennial uh, podcast. Yeah, I'm the one that killed you uh, on the arena yesterday. I'm a very serious vid video gamer, whoever of you are, is a video gamer. So, yeah, I, pl I play an older game. I play Halo, but in Halo, okay. in Halo, I'm in the top three of every million players. What? Yes, yes, yes. So, so yeah, I, I am the one that killed them. Yes, you're <laughs> old. But, 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 that, but the thing here is this. Hmm? I'm not that way. Because I frown on the screen and, you know, I focus and concentrate and I do spreadsheets. and No, I'm like that because I'm a kid. Mm. I play like a kid. I engage with the game. I flow completely, right? I flow with life. Flowing with life is the skill. Mm. Mm? Resisting life and trying to control life is an industrial revolution skill. Yeah. L you know, any, any wise person I've ever met does not resist life at all. Any wise person I've ever met will take life as it's coming, like a wave, yeah. like a surfer. Hmm? They will notice the wave as it's coming, and instead of being crushed by it or trying to resist it, which is <laughs> stupid, okay, they see what they can do with that wave and ride it. Right? And, and that's the game of life. The game of life is we're wiser as kids than, where we, that, than what we are as adults. Yeah. And then eventually some of us you know, continue to be grumpy for the rest of, of their life. And some of us realize there's so much joy in this. Yeah. There's so much joy in spending this one hour with you. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be a waste if I ended, you know, up achieving six targets and not having the joy of feeling so your true. energy and your presence and, you know, it's... Having fun. Having fun and telling my truth, by the mm. way. I'm almost certain half of your audience have switched off by now, but, you know, the ones that are remaining are, are having a good time, right? And that's the game. It's not, it's not a target. Life is not a target at all. If you think of life as a target, eventually the game will be over and you will die. Life is not a target. Life is 
the game itself. It's the game play, right? And as you play every minute of that game, it's such as so much fun. Mm -hmm. Even the difficult times are fun because real gamers don't see them as difficult. They see them as a challenge. I, you know, I, I can't play normal on my game because it's too easy. I need to play at legendary level when I'm playing campaigns. Legendary is barely enough to, 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 to even take my attention, you know, like, you know, to make me mm. focus in because, and, and most normal players, when they play legendary, they're not going to be able to even stay alive for a minute. And it will feel very difficult and it will feel traumatic and it will feel that life is against you. It's not at all. You're just not a good gamer yet. That is a really interesting point. When you play an easy game, you don't focus, you're bored of it. Totally. How interesting. Absolutely. So if your life and is you don't easy, learn. Yeah. And you don't develop and you don't ah. become a better gamer. I love that. Yeah. The other thing that I found unusual, which I know you've spoken about a lot, is the way you deal with grief and the way you deal with problems and the, deal, the way you cope with times where you're unhappy. Yeah. So your son passed away from an operation that could have been prevented. And I asked you earlier, how did you forgive those doctors? There was nothing to forgive. Can I just close before we go there by saying, so every, every parent who's wise will learn from their kids. It's not that I'm the only one that learned from Ali. Mm. We are more enlightened as children, okay? If you disagree with your children, it's because of your conditioning. Your human nature is like them. Learn from them. How, when when the doctor when Ali went Ali went for a for a for a, a simple appendix inflammation, and the doctor that did the surgery had done four hundred and forty surgeries of that kind before. Wow. Okay, and in my in my son's case, he punctured a blood vessel, and it exploded, and they didn't fix it properly. So, my son's uh, vital organs started to fail, and he left our world. The f you know, the first thought that comes to your mind is the doctor killed my son. Mm. The doctor murdered Mali. Mm. Which doctor does that? Mm. Which doctor wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to murder my patient and end my career? They don't. They don't, right? If, if you and I made a mistake on this podcast, it will mean that we have to stop and do it again and the, and the video editor has to fix it. Yes. Right? That's the cost of my mistake. Yeah. The cost of a surgeon's mistake is the patient's life. Yeah. And so I called my, my brother, who's a surgeon as well, and I said, this and this happened. Is that even possible? And he said, yeah, it happens around 10 million times a year. Wow. Yeah. You know, doctors make mistakes. Mm. They fix them most of the time. Mm? But there, there were statistics that in many countries around the world, medical mistakes are between the first and the third top reason for death in every country, every country in the world, mm -hmm. right? Just happens, you can't, you can't expect perfection. And so I could torture myself for years with the doctor murdered my son. Or I can reframe it and say, the doctor wanted to save my son, but made a mistake. Big difference, okay? Big difference, why? Because for in one of them, I want to kill the doctor for his intention to kill my son. Uh, and from the other, I can see that my objective should be that this malpractice or that negligence or that mistake never happens again. So my scope is more the hospital, the process, the, yeah. right? Which is what I did. Yeah. Mm? W not with the objective of, you know, drinking the blood of the doctor so that yes. I'm cured. That doesn't help. It wouldn't mm. bring Ali back. My only objective was I'm going to make sure that this is brought to the attention of the right people so that, so that no one else loses their child. Okay? It's a very different objective than I want to kill the doctor. Right? And so I, I, I say that with respect, but sometimes, uh, you know, early in the conflict of Russia and Ukraine, people would, would, would tell me that their objective, you know, that they, that they pray that the Russian soldiers would die. Mm. Okay? And I would ask them and say, shouldn't you pray that the Ukrainian citizens should live? Yes. Right? And, and it's, it's the same fabric. It's the same event. Hmm? But one of them is motivated by the positive and the other is motivated by the negative. Mm -hmm. hmm? And I think the reality of the matter, I think it was Gandhi or Nelson Mandela, probably Nelson Mandela, that said, you know, 
holding a grudge is like drinking poison. It is. And hoping that the other person will die. Sick, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, I sometimes in my heart, and again, I get thousands and thousands of people talking to me every week, and I try to orient them in the right direction. But sometimes you get a parent that loses a child, and they're, you know, it's as if it's not enough to lose a child. Hmm? They're, they're, they're held up in that space where there is pain and anger and, and you know, vengeance. And, mm. you know, and some of them spend 10 years of their life trying to get back at someone. Or, yeah, and you may eventually get back at them. You may. But you wasted 10 years of your life. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that finally after getting back at them, your son's not back. Grief is such a difficult thing. It's a really hard beast to manage because whilst I understand everything you're saying in terms of if something happens, you either focus on what you can control or focus on what you can't, yeah. right? What action can I take from this? A lot of people would find that cold. So for example, let's say someone, let's say my child, God forbid, passed away. I don't have children, but let's just say. And the next day I said, well, the child's gone. I'm not going to waste even one moment of my life in hoping that they come back. I have accepted that this is the situation. People would say I'm the world's worst mother. Would they? Yes. Would they be right? Maybe I didn't love my child enough is what people would say. Did you not? Maybe I didn't. If you didn't, then it doesn't matter if you, for, if you moved on or not. So true. That's the problem. And if you did, only you know you did. And who gives a shit what they think about mm. it? Okay. So he here's the question. What is cruel? Is it cruel to hold on to the grudge and deprive my lovely daughter from my love after my son left? Hmm? Or is it cruel to love my daughter hmm? and, and hug her and be there for her by not holding on to the grudge? Yeah. Which one is cruel? Okay. Which one is affected more? Hmm? Those that I love after my son uh, left, that I can influence their life positively, exactly. in including by now tens of millions of people that learned his method of happiness. Okay? Or he, which is one person that literally doesn't give a shit about this physical world anymore. Okay? Now, you hit the nail on the head. These are conditionings, you know, uh, cases of conditioning and egos. Yeah. Okay. So I'll be very open and honest. Huh? The day Ali died, I couldn't drink a sip of water. Mm. The next day, I had to drink. Mm. The following day, I had a cup of coffee. Mm. The following day, I ate. Mm. Hmm? Two weeks later, my ex and I were making love. Mm. You know what? Life has a very interesting way of making or forcing you to live. Yeah. Right? In every physical form, you will live. You will go on. Unless your life ends too, you will go on, right? You may choose, if you want to, to go on physically and torture yourself psychologically. Do you think life cares? No. Do you think anyone cares? No. Right? So, believe it or not, it's actually the ultimate form and sign of love hmm? to tell my son when I put him in his grave with my own hands four mm -hmm. hours after he left hmm? to tell him that I love him very much and I will see him soon mm. and that until I see him I will do the best with the life that I still have not for myself in a selfish way celebrating that n now that I cut the expenses of one of my children that's not true at all mm. okay I have a, a hole in my heart that will never mend never okay but I can go through life as a real human feeling and living at the same time, okay? Feeling and living at the same time. The Stoics will tell you hmm, that there is no point. That we, we, so basically, the Stoic approach is to say we live for virtue. Okay. Okay? We do what is right. Mm. We do what is right because it's the only way to make your life and the life of those you care about better. Right? And, and, and the question is, how do you define what is right? So in the case of losing a child, if your heart aches and you're crying, cry your eyes out for as long as you want. Mm. 
Mm. Okay? If you're refusing to go, you know, say your husband dies, and you're refusing to go to date another man, yeah. hmm, because you miss your husband and you're not ready, I respect you. I love yeah. you. Okay? But if you're, if, you're, if you're refusing because what will they think about me? Well, they will think that you're human, by the way. And if they, they don't, understand. yeah, and if they don't, they don't deserve mm. your, your sympathy to them, right? Because you know what? Everyone will judge you, whichever choice you will make, if it doesn't match theirs, until they're your, in your position and they will do exactly like you. So true. That's how humanity is. And, you know, my, my wonderful son, you know, talking about how much he taught me. Hmm? When, when we moved to Dubai the third time, I, you know, I, at early in his life, I had so many moves in my career. So he was probably eight. Uh, and, you know, it was his ninth school or something like that. Wow. And he comes back home, you know, saying, OK, you know what? I still managed to make a friend today. Mm. Right. And Ali was a quiet boy, so he didn't really make friends that easily. But he made a friend, and now he's really happy that at least the move comes with a friend. And, right? He, his friend Ali was a tiny little Zen monk, <laughs> and, and, and his friend, his new friend George, was the devil himself. Totally and honestly. I mean, not in a bad way. He was a lovely boy. But you know those boys that have so much energy, they're very loud, they're running all the time, he's very destructive. When he, you know, when he breaks something, he doesn't even notice, right? And Ali kept up with George from Monday. You know, he met him on Sunday, he kept up with him from Monday till Thursday. Mm -hmm. And then on Thursday, he came home and he said, Papa, if George calls, tell him I don't want to be his friend anymore. Right? Okay. And I was like, what? Uh, what? what did he do? Uh, yeah. Right? Uh, by when that happened... You know, the phone rings. We had landlines at the time. So I go pick up the phone. George is on the other side of the line saying, is Ali there? And, you know, and I'm like, yeah, but he and I'm about to tell him that he doesn't want to be your friend anymore. And he says, OK, I'm going. Uh, sorry. OK, I'm coming. Oh. Right? And then within 10 minutes, his mother drops him off at the door okay. and leaves. <laughs> right. So George zoom, zooms through the door, runs everywhere, hitting things. You know, we had a cat. The cat runs away. And, and Ali slowly comes down the stairs and looks at him and says, Hi, George. Uh, remember when we spoke at school, I told you I don't want to be your friend anymore. But anyway, the Xbox is there if you want to play. And you know your way around the kitchen. You take anything you want. And then he goes back up. Right? So I call the mother. Hmm, and I entertain George until she comes back to take him. And I have no idea what's happening. Yeah. And, and then I go up to Ali and I say, Ali, why did you do this, Habibi? Yeah. And he said, Papa, he takes so much of my energy. He takes so much of my energy. And if I try to keep up with him, people who love me for who I am mm -hmm. are not going to be my friends. How old was he? He was 11. My gosh. Right. And, and I remember vividly now because I said eight earlier. He was 11. OK. And he basically said, Look, you know, I can be who I am, exactly as I am, and then some people will like me who are like me, so I will like them too, mm. okay? Or I can pretend to be any other piece of shit, and then other pieces of shit will like me, okay? For something that I'm not. Yes. So it will be very difficult for me to be the person that they expect me to be, and I'm not even enjoying their company. Right? And I'm not enjoying being faking it. And I'm not enjoying faking it. So mm. his point of view was, if I am who I am, I'm not going to get the Georges. Yeah. I'm going to get people like me. Yeah. Right? And that's exactly what happened. The next week, he meets uh, uh, Jack, was his first friend, then Nick, then uh, uh, Sam, you know, then so Max. And, and those kids were literally f exact copies of Ali's cool and wisdom and, and calm. And, and they were 11 at the time and they stayed friends until Ali left our world and you know some of them got together and created her, his band and you know, it was a beautiful friendship and the thing is as those kids walked in school or in any shopping mall in Dubai or wherever people would flock to them <laughs> because they were real mm. right and and they were not pretending they were simply wonderful and connected and deep and they loved each other deeply just by stopping to care about what others thought of me yeah. Now, what did people think of me when Ali died? Doesn't matter. Mm. 
what I thought of Ali when he died is what matters. Yeah. And what I thought of Ali was this amazing teacher that taught me so many things that I knew about happiness that I needed to tell the world about. Mm. And that, that's the truth of the, of the matter. The matter is, the truth of the matter is that Ali left. Yeah. And here I am, his, not his father, his student. Yes. Okay? Fearing that what he taught me is going to be lost. So I sit down and I write it in a book that becomes an international bestseller in 33 languages. Amazing. Right? Not because of my skill, but because of that beautiful flow that mm. life said, he's no longer here, write what he taught you. Instead of resisting and saying, okay, why is he no longer there? Life, come and give me a report and show me what's happened. Why? So what are the rules of happiness? What makes us happy? We're happy when the events of life seem to meet our expectations of how we want life to be. That's it. That's what I call the happiness equation. Happiness is equal to or greater than the difference between the events of your life and how you expect life to behave. Okay? And every moment in your life you ever felt unhappy was a moment where you looked at the event, it doesn't matter what the event was, and compared it to how you want life to be. Mm -hmm. And as a result, if life missed your expectations, you became unhappy. If life met your expectations, you became happy. So true. It's as simple as that, right? Which basically means, remember your point about happiness is a choice? Yeah. Okay? Which basically means that the act or the, the, the state of happiness is triggered by your perception of the events of life that happens in your brain, mm -hmm. not in life itself. Okay? And your expectations of how life should be, which is set in your brain, not by life itself. Mm. Okay? You're comparing the, something that's happening in your brain to something that is set by your brain. Mm. Tell me that this is not a choice. Okay? Mm -hmm. you know, you, 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 rain doesn't make you happy or unhappy. Rain makes you happy, very happy, if it's your ex-boyfriend's wedding. Right? You, you choose that. Okay? Or, by the way, you could choose to look at your ex-boyfriend and have the compassion in your heart to say, he's a human, we are not a good match, I'm so sorry that his wedding is spoiled, rain is making me unhappy. It's a choice. Makes me sad, yeah. It's a choice, right? And, you know, it is a choice on anything that happens in life to actually look at life hmm, and say, you know, I, I give the example of being stuck in traffic. Mm. Hmm? Stuck in traffic would make anyone unhappy because, you know what, I am His Highness himself. I shouldn't be wasting 60 minutes of my life, right? Or, you know, a, f an, an, a flight is delayed. Mm. I find that really funny. Okay, it's like I'm supposed to fly from Dubai to London mm. in seven hours. Okay, in the past it took like six months and I died on the way. <laughs> now it's seven hours, right? And you know, Emirates <coughs> Airlines, uh, you know, apologizes and says we're 20 minutes late. And by the way, we're going to make it up on the way. Yeah. Right. And I'm everyone, so sorry. Uh, everyone throws their bags <laughs> on the floor and the. Ugh. What? You know, His Highness is going to be 20 minutes late? What, does, what do you think you're dealing with, right? Crazy. So true. Crazy. We've and become so entitled. I, I, yeah, and, and last, last time I was in Bahrain uh, in, in March, okay, to speak to the Formula One team. I'm a, I'm a huge car geek. Okay. And, I, and, I, and I restore many cars with my hands. I understand <laughs> everything of the mechanics of cars. I love cars. And mm -hmm. I, get, I get the invitation to speak to the Mercedes F1 team. Mm. And I spend an, an, a day in the pits with mm -hmm. the team. Like, unbelievable experience. Then I get home. I, I was just moving to my new home. And I had a fish tank that I didn't have fish in, but I had plants in and I was preparing it. And as I walk in, my fish tank is almost empty. And my floor is completely, uh, you know, covered with, flooded with water, the water of the tank. And you can look at that and you say, oh my God, life is horrible. What is this flooding tank? And you can tell yourself, for that to happen, I need to have a home yeah. to start. Yeah. I need to have a fish tank in it to start. <laughs> I need to have access to water. By the way, you don't know how many people don't. Mm. Right? I, I also, by the way, didn't have ta fish in the tank, so nothing died. Hmm? And I need to have the luxury of leaving that home and flying to another country and talking to the F1 team and, you know, uh, uh, um, being viewed as a valuable contributor to society and, 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 mm. and, and yet I'm focused on the wet floor. How stupid is that? So nothing upsets you? Uh, no, it's, it's, so if you take the happiness equation, 
being unhappy or sad or worried or anxious or whatever is a survival mechanism. Yeah. If, not, if nothing upsets me, I wouldn't be human. Okay. The question is, and, and, and that, by the way, again, top monks in the world. I hosted Matthew Ricard. I love Matthew. Uh, Matthew is uh, one of the world most renowned uh, uh, monks, more than 60,000 hours of lifetime meditation. Wow. Unbelievable. Unbelievable human and in every possible way. His brain itself is reconfigured for happiness, right? And, and I ask him jokingly, and I say on my podcast, I said, Matthew, so you're, you never, you know, you're, the, you're known in the news headlines as the world happiest man. Mm. Are you never unhappy? And he bursts laughing in his very French accent and goes like, what are you talking about me? <laughs> I'm always pissed off. Okay. And, and he's, he's very honest about it. He says the state of the world, the injustice, the suffering of others, all of that makes me very unhappy. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, the more awakened you become, the less you become unhappy about stupid things. Mm. You become unhappy about important things. Yeah. But the nature of unhappiness itself is the same. Mm. Right. And, and if you're unhappy, most happiness practitioners don't measure how how infrequently you become unhappy. That's the wrong thing. It's almost like saying, I'm going to switch off the fire alarm just because it's noisy. Yeah. Right. You want the fire alarm to tell you something is not meeting your expectations. Mm. Right. But we all measure the bounce back time so true. from from the time I feel that something is not right within me. OK. To the time I can return back to happiness. That's what you measure. That's mm. what you try to improve on, right? It's almost like saying, if I have a sore throat, I need to do something about it. Mm. You don't want to, re to, 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 to dampen your immune system or your, your sensations so that you don't feel a sore, a sore throat. You want to feel it, mm. okay? Uh, but then you want to tell yourself, how do I get back out of this? You know, yes. honey and lemon, or am I going to take mm. a medicine, or am I going to, you know, take a vitamin C? Am I going to wait for a little bit? Am I going to not go to work today? Whatever mm. it is, mm. right? And so happiness practitioners will measure back, will measure that bounce back time. Got it. Okay. And in my, and I'm not bragging, I swear I'm not bragging, but in my case, that bounce back time is seven seconds on average between the time you make me unhappy uh, or that life gives me a reason to be unhappy. Most of the time, like there are several times a year where it will be an hour or a week or whatever, but most of the time it's seven seconds. Why? Because I ask three questions. I call it the happiness flow chart. OK, and it's a flow chart, so it's so mechanical in my head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you know, you and I go out there and we order a smoothie. Yeah. Right. And and, you know, the smoothie is not cold enough. Yeah. OK. And, you know, the first thought that comes to my head is, uh, you know, this restaurant uh, disrespects me. Uh, they would uh, they would give a cold <laughs> smoothie to a white person, but a person of color they want. OK. Right. Mm -hmm. We get those thoughts. You know, your mm. partner says something hurtful on Friday yeah. and on Saturday you tell yourself he or she doesn't love me anymore. Yes. It's not the event. It's your thought about it Correct. that creates the unhappiness. Right. Yeah. First question is, is that true? Mm. Is that true? I mean, I had a, a friend of mine who, who walks into my apartment and says the Uber uh, driver disrespected me. And I was like, how can he disrespect you if he doesn't know anything about you? So true. Right. He needs to know something about you and then say, uh, that's disrespectful. Yeah. Or I disrespect that. Right. Mm. So most of the time, it's not true. Ninety percent of the time, ninety nine percent of the time, most of the events of your life, if you actually see them, the, 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 the tank is empty and the floor is flooded. Mm. It's just a tiny subset of the truth. Mm. If you see the full truth. OK. I had an amazing time with an amazing people in an amazing trip. And, rah, 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 rah. and yes, by the way, the water is also flooded. Yeah. Right. When you see it all in, 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 you know, in reality, you can't tell yourself life is against me. So true. Right. If it's not true, drop it. That's question number one. If it is true, what are you going to do to fix it? Mm. That's the only reason for unhappiness. Happy, unhappiness is a survival mechanism. Mm. It's basically t basically telling you that your brain looked at the world around it. Mm. It found that an event doesn't meet its expectations of safety. So it's alerting you in the form of an emotion. It's really not that complicated. Goral Gopal Das, who's this um, monk, he wrote this book and he has this equation and it says, do you have a problem? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Can you solve it? Great. Yeah. Can you not? It's not a problem. Move on. Yeah, it's not your problem. What can you do? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it's a simple question. Yeah. Can you solve it? Do something about it. If you can't, you can't. 
Exactly. So what and, can you and, do? And the flow chart is if you can fix it, fix it. Exactly. Okay. If you cannot accept and make your life better despite his presence. Exactly. Yeah, which is basically what I did with Ali's death. I cannot bring him, bring him back. Mm. So question two is, can you fix it? No, I can't fix it. He's gone. Yeah. Right? Question number three is, so what can I do now? I can accept that he died. Mm. Hmm? Yeah, it's not the f f my favorite feeling in the world. Of course. Right? But then I can take that new baseline of my life, which is really the worst baseline I've ever felt. Yeah. And then say, tomorrow I'll do something that makes my life better than today. After tomorrow, I'll do something that makes my life better than tomorrow. And why do we feel we have to always wait? You know, we always feel we, it's not the right time now, but in five years' time, then it's socially acceptable for me to move on. Ego. You know? Yeah. It's all about ego. Mm. Okay. It's not only ego of people. Uh, what will people think of me? It's what, what I think. It's, it's not only what will the de dying person mm. think of me. It's what will I think of me. Yeah. I'll think of me as a practical loving person that does not need so to true. close his uh, say himself in a room and hit his he head against the wall for Ali to know that he loves him. And there's this beautiful quote and I can't remember the name I think it's by Cooley and it says I'm not what I think I am I'm not what you think I am I am what I think you think I am. <laughs> there you go. And so yeah. you're just trapped in, that, in this yeah. echo chamber yeah. thinking about what, other, what, what you think someone else thinks of you. I think the most powerful skill in life is to not give a shit. Mark Manson's book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a... <laughs> yeah. No, don't, seriously. You're so right. L life is to be lived. You, you need to give a lot of shit mm. about being ethical and moral in life. Yes. Because karma is real. I agree. Okay. Beyond that, it's all a video game. I think you also know when you're doing something that's correct and wrong Absolutely. and you have that feeling in your gut. But I want to talk to you really quickly around Form because they are the sponsor of this podcast. Ah, I know and that, I they are the greatest protein powder I've ever tried because it has all of these vitamins. It's plant based. These are all compostable pouches as well. So that, you know, they're really great for the environment. And the and vanilla is delicious. Vanilla is really good. That used yep. to be my favorite. Uh -huh. Chocolate hazelnut at the moment is my favorite because it comes in all tried these. That, actually. You haven't tried it? Well, I've got yeah. one for you. So <laughs> you can try it in all these different flavors. But I think what's really great is that. It's very easy for me to travel with it. It's very easy for me to get my nutrients, my protein. And as a vegetarian, it's very difficult for me to incorporate a lot of protein in my diet when I don't eat meat. And this is what I mean about choices. A lot of people will say, well, I'm vegetarian, so I can't necessarily have a lot of protein and protein powder is bad for you. But find one that doesn't have added sugar or added preservatives or added sweeteners and find something that works for your body that you can fit into your lifestyle. Totally with you. I tried uh, form before, actually. And... Um, you know, I don't do ads at all, but I actually like them. <laughs> so I met I met Natalie uh, at one of those entrepreneur uh, dinners. Uh, yeah. 20, 2019, I think. And she was so spot on. She's very spiritual. Very. Beautifully seeking. Uh, yes. And then uh, she was like, you have to try them. And I tried them. And then... I tried them more. I like them very much. They're actually. great. I'm yeah. excited for you to try. And, I, and I'm with you, by the way. I d I'm, I'm mostly vegetarian, mostly. Yeah. So, uh, occasionally I eat animal protein, but very, very f few times, which mm. I think is, uh, doesn't have to be black or white. No. Uh, but I think as a, as a vegetarian or a vegan, it becomes almost impossible, despite the, uh, you know, the documentaries that will tell yeah. you that you can... you can get your protein needs. You can, but, yes, you, but you have to burn 4,000 calories a day to burn everything else that came with the protein. Yes, uh, yeah, this it's is a lot processed. Yeah. Before, the one of the one of the things that I want to speak to you about, which I know we're so over, I don't think this is the world's longest podcast for a millennial mind, but you speak a lot about masculine and feminine energy. Yeah. And we've spoken about this off camera. Yeah. Talk to me about why you think we don't have to be equal. Oh, 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 oh. How much time you're trying do we to have? get me cancelled. No, uh, no. All right. So, so here's my point of view. My point of view is that man, woman is body parts. This yes. is biology. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, you wanna, you wanna, um, uh, you know, just define it as a very simple science. If those things exist, then you're this or that. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Uh, you know, gender identity, sexual preferences are what they are. Gender identity, sexual preferences. I believe that all of us, without exception, have a bit of masculine, a bit of feminine in us. 
uh, where masculine and feminine are basically traits. Mm. They are the way, the way you deal with life. The mm -hmm. way. So, so if I give the feminine a problem, they will tend, you know, to use feminine again. Could be man, woman, straight, gay, doesn't matter. But if I, if I, I give. Uh, you know, a problem to someone who associates with the feminine, they'll use creativity and maybe intuition to arrive at, at an answer. Okay. If you give it to uh, someone who associates with the masculine, they'll use linear thinking and analytical thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, none of us is 100% feminine, 100% masculine. So most of us will use a bit of this and a bit of that. Yes. Right. But with different ratios. So those mm. who associate with the feminine will be thirty percent, seventy percent in the direction of intuition and creativity. Yeah. Let's say, okay. And when you see it that way, you suddenly realize that we uh, um, have sadly demonized the feminine, mm. even as we empowered women. Yeah. We've demonized the feminine. Why? Because we asked women to come into the workplace or the politics space or whatever it is that is engaged in life, and we told them, behave in your masculine, okay? And many do, right? But, you know, in a, in a, in a very interesting way, if I told you to carry 100 kilograms and run across a track seven times, it may take you a lot of training to be able to do it, and even as you do it, you're never going to be better than someone who's six, six foot five and very muscular, right? Yeah. So, so by definition, if it's not your... Uh, if it's not your uh, strong trait, yes. at best you're going to be okay at it. You're rarely going to, to, to beat the others at it. And if you do beat the others at it, you will have to really, really forego some of your nature. Not every, mm. uh, uh, you know, so w f woman and man uh, are archetypically associated with, uh, with feminine and masculine. Meaning, mm. you know, if you take something, let's take a very, uh, a very, uh, um, you know, clear one, nurturing, for example, uh, happens to be a, a lot more associated with the female of the species than it is with the male of the species. The male of the species would be associated with protection and strength, right? Yes. So statistically, mm -hmm. uh, uh, if, if you asked a woman to, you know, or, or someone who is archetypically uh, uh, female, if you want uh, to, to, to exert that strength of uh, uh, of protection, mm. Mm, yeah, she will be able to, mm. right? Uh, if you ask, uh, you know, someone who's uh, masculine to exert uh, uh, nurturing, mm. he will be able to. He here is not a gender identity here. He, he, he here is masculine, basically, but not, a, not going to be the best in the world at it, let's put it this way. Yeah. So, so my call has been for many years to say two things. One is we're never happy unless we allow ourselves to be where we are, mm. who we are in resonance. I, you know, I, I spoke of that, uh, you know, when you were on my podcast of that uh, tuning fork, when, you, you, when we used to use a tuning fork to tune our guitars and you would hit the fork and its natural resonance is E. Yeah. Okay. My natural resonance is Mo. Mm. Okay, and Mo is a mix of feminine and masculine. Like when you when we spoke about proteins, and I told you I'm mostly vegan. Yes. But sometimes I eat, you know, chicken like twice a week or whatever. There is no classification for that. Of course. You don't call that vegan. You don't call it vegetarian. You don't call it pescatarian. People call it flexitarian now. You, you call it <laughs> motarian. Okay, motarian is eating what Mo likes. Yes. Is behaving as Mo would behave. Mm. And I think the big, the big, I hope that we arrive at that in all of the debates that are happening in the world is to, is to understand eventually that there is no uh, two categories or 10 categories or 100 categories or 1,000 categories. There is 7.8 billion categories around the world. Correct. Right? And, and if you see it that way, you so suddenly try to, to start to tell yourself it's not good for, s for us to empower the masculine mm. or empower the feminine, we should just empower everyone to be exactly who they are. And embrace right? who we are. Yeah. And, and, and if we allow that to happen, what will end up happening, interestingly, is there will be more feminine showing up in the world because we've suppressed the feminine really badly. Okay. Mm. We've created a game hmm, where, you know, uh, uh, traits like competitiveness or uh, linear uh, discipline or um, you know, uh, strengths hmm, are sort of made mandatory to win in the game, okay? When in reality, 
uh, you know, Natalie, for example, and Natalie's success, Natalie is very feminine, mm -hmm. right? And her, her main, main, in my view, main, f you know, reason for success is that, at least from the times I met her, is that she can, as, you know, she has empathy for what people actually need to have a healthy diet, right? Yes. She has, you know, an appreciation for what is nurturing and what isn't, okay? All feminine traits. Mm. Mm. Gandhi, for example, mm, even though in a, in a, in a male body, mm. nonviolent resistance, uh, resistance is clearly a feminine trait, mm. okay? Violence and strength and fighting is a masculine trait, which, mm. by the way, is not to be demonized. Mm? Strength and, f and 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 uh, you know and the ability to protect is a wonderful, wonderful trait that protected humanity. It's overplaying it, turning it into aggression or wars or whatever. That's a problem, right? Okay. I I, I always say it's Steve Jobs. Mm. Most people remember Steve Jobs as that executive, obnoxious, you know, forceful, all masculine traits. But what made him successful was appreciation of beauty, appreciation of art, uh, you mm. know, uh, empathy for the user's needs uh, and so on, right? Mm. Creativity, all, all feminine traits. Mm. And I think the reminder I've been trying to tell the whole world is that, believe it or not, I've never been more successful in my life until I enabled my feminine to lead my masculine. My masculine is able to do so well. I'm yes. such a good executor when it comes to projects. But my feminine is the visionary. It is the you know, the, 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 the creative, the playful and, mm. you know, and, and, and joyful part of me that goes through those difficult projects with fun, that considers life to be a video game, right? And without those, life becomes very dull, mm. becomes very uncreative, becomes very um, um, dry. And I think, uh, you know, there was a, a very good book, The Master and His Emissary, that basically says every one of us has both. Yeah. It's just that the feminine should come first. You should cons consult the feminine first on what it is that we want to be and then ask the masculine to execute so that we can do. Because I'm, I'm so happy you said that because there'll be people listening saying, well, you know, I have both and people are annoyed that I've tapped into my masculine because, you know, the feminine, you're all saying the feminine has been suppressed. A lot of people would argue the masculine in women has been suppressed. Oh, is that true? A lot of people would say that. And now that they're able to balance both is why we're seeing so many people succeed in life. It's because there's a balance of both. I, I don't think there is an, a, a correct answer. Okay? Mm. I think the correct answer is dig deep into who you really are. Instead and of remember, following what other people are saying. Yeah, remember what you said on my podcast, when you, what you said on my podcast is that the, you know, the answer is to see what you enjoy. Yes. Okay? And if you see what you enjoy and do more of it, you'll be fine. So right? true. And, and so ask yourself if you're in a meeting and you're tapping on the table and saying we have to kill the competition. Is that what you enjoy? Is that if, who you really are and what you want to be? Yeah, if, mm. if that's who you, who you really are and what you want to be, then that's you. Mm. Go become a wrestler. That's wonderful, right? Uh, if what you are is basically saying, hey, people, can we just go join together and see the world in abundance? And, you know, the reality is that there is another market other than our competitor's market. We can capture that. Mm. It's easier and we can, you know, even collaborate with our competitor. Mm. Then you're in your feminine well done, uh, you know, you're in a good place. This is why I find it hard when people say, are you an intro or an extrovert? And I say, I don't know, because <laughs> I love people, but I love being by myself. And we have all of these labels and I can never figure it out. And so, for so Sarah Kane, Sarah or Susan Kane, uh, Quiet. Okay. Have you read that no. book? Oh my God, it's the Bible. I think Bible. I need to. Okay. Oh my God, if everyone should read that. I mean, introverts should read that. Okay. Uh, if you don't know, by the way, you're an introvert. Just so, so really, <laughs> I mean, okay. We're all we're all trained to be extroverts. You can't function in the modern world <laughs> unless you're a, an extrovert. But you know, her 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 view in in quiet is that it's not it's not be, it's social shyness and it's not your ability to deal with others that determines it. She basically said introverts get their energy from being alone and extroverts get their energy from others. So the, the test is, if you're out there with 20 people, doesn't matter if you can deal with them or not. I speak in front of, you know, 20,000 people and I, you know, it's fine. Mm. Uh, uh, it's just that they take my energy. And yes. then I would have to go back home and, you know, Recoup. plug myself in and recover. Mm. Okay. There are others, however, that if you put in a room and say you can't meet people for three hours, 
they would get drained. <laughs> yeah. So if you, it's very easy to find if you that want to. That is so funny. Yeah. Whenever we go to my friend's weddings, I remember this one time, I said to everyone, between the wedding and reception, I want my own space. And everyone was like, <laughs> okay, whatever. And we went back and I was went upstairs. I sat in the room by myself for the four hours in between. And my friend sat downstairs the whole time. Yeah. And then they came in the door and they said, do you not want to come down? And they said, sorry, Shivani, we're not going to disturb you because we know you like your alone time. But just wanted to ask you really quickly, will you have this when you wake up? And they respected it. Yeah. And then I could go down and like have the best time at the reception. Correct. But I needed that time to myself. But I also get energy if I go to a crowd and I'm doing a speaker event and everyone's being loving and kind, I pick it up straight away. But if I also meet people and they drain me, I also pick that up straight away. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, un I'm undecided. Yeah. But out of everything you talk around, grief, stress, happiness, AI killing the world, we don't have time to cover that today. <laughs> But stress is something that I think affects everyone. Yeah. How do we cope? Oh, man. It's going to upset you, but stress is also a choice. Interesting. It's not, it's not the events of life that stress you. It's the way you deal with them that does. Mm. And uh, so, so I, uh, you know, my book, Unstressable, is coming out by the end of the year. But we've had this membership with hundreds of members uh, where we discuss stress on a monthly basis. Um, yeah, and it is actually quite eye-opening because the way I looked at stress, being the person that I am, uh, was an attempt to understand it in mathematics, as I always do, a happiness equation and a stress equation and a fatigue or, you know, burnout equation and so on. And it's quite eye-opening because when you look at stress in physics, mm. uh, it doesn't matter how much force you apply to a, an object. What matters is the force divided by the square area of the object. That's the stress. Okay. Right? So um, a camel is like half a ton, but it doesn't sink in the sand because the hoofs are very wide. Right? So the square area, the resources the camel has to carry the force, is large enough to deal with the force. And in humans, your stress is the challenges you face divided by your skills and abilities and resources to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the inter you, you, it doesn't take a genius to realize that because, you know, si things mm -hmm. that I freaked out about in my 20s, you know, handled with a little bit of difficulty in my 30s, handled with ease in my 40s. Now I don't even stop to look at them. Yeah. They don't stress me at all. They don't mm -hmm. even seem to be a stressful event. Why? Because I've de developed over time, I've developed the, you know, the skills and resources to deal with them. Mm -hmm. Right. And so. So when we're dealing with stress, most people will say the immediate answer is to reduce the forces applied to you. Mm -hmm. And that, by the way, is definitely the first uh, part of our model, which is to limit the stresses that are unnecessary. But you can also work on your skills and resources, right? And that probably will take the stress away. I, I as I studied stress from a, a, a biological point of view, however, I realized that stress is not a bad thing at all. If you've mm. seen the Hulk, the movie, you know, that's the stress, basically. It's a, a shot of cortisol in your blood that reconfigures you mm. in a way that makes you incredibly superhuman. Yeah. And, and there are stories of mothers, for example, that would carry a car from <laughs> on top of her child, right? Wow. Yeah, and, and it is very interesting how we reconfigure the hardware completely. Your brain is faster. Mm. Your eyes are more efficient. Your muscles are stronger. Everything works differently. Mm. But that stress was designed for humans to last a very short period of time, okay? And that the problem is not the stress itself. The problem is the point of breakage. Where, when do you break? And, and we break in three situations. We break either under trauma, so excessive stress in a very short period of time uh, that, uh, that basically breaks you, okay? We break under what I call the anticipation of future th stress. So worry, fear, anxiety, and panic, mm -hmm. okay? Or we break in burnout, mm. okay? Uh, trauma is not within our control. It's a very strong uh, external event, okay? But the good news is 91% of humans statistically are going to be subjected to one PTSD trauma, you know, uh, inducing pr tra traumatic event once in their life. Okay, why is uh, that good news? Because 97% recover within six months. Wow. Yeah. So, so, uh, so basically, only through per three percent of humans, or three point, you know, two point seven percent of humans, will remain broken post six months from the trauma. 
Wow, right? that's amazing. It is it really is quite eye opening, and uh, and and honestly, one of the reasons why we said you know trauma is left for trauma experts, and we didn't talk, you know write about it myself and my co-author on on the book. But but the all, all, the other good news is that post traumatic growth is very very true, mm. right? So so if you manage to find your way back from trauma, you're stronger and more resilient than when you went in. So six months. Uh, mostly, by the way, uh, it's three months, but mm. up to six months of your life for, in exchange for post-traumatic growth is okay, right? Have you read the book Anti-Fragile? Yeah, exactly the point. So I got this necklace mm -hmm. and it says on here, Anti-Fragile. There you go. Because from chaos you can rise. Absolutely. And, and from and any as a difficult as, situation as a matter you of can fact, grow. Yeah, the only time you grow is, is, yeah. from, uh, is from those difficult situations, mm. which leaves us with the other two. And the other two are? A choice, mm. right? So the anticipation of future stress is one of the biggest reasons for stress in our world today. Anxiety, specifically, if you yeah. think about it. And if you uh, if you understand how that works, you have to understand fear and all of its derivatives. Okay, and so fear appears to be very erratic, but it isn't. It yeah. is very logical for an engineer like me to say that <laughs> fear is the is the human response to an equation, which is a moment in the future is less safe for me than this moment. If I know that a moment in the future is less safe than now, I feel fear, mm. okay? And when I feel that fear, what do I do? I react by trying to make that moment safe. Mm. Okay, understand that. Worry, on the other hand, is not that moment in the future is, un is less safe. Worry is I suspect that a moment in the future is not safe. I'm not sure, mm. right? And most of us will address that by trying to fix the moment in the future when the, re the actual reaction should be, I should verify if I should be afraid so or, or calm. Mm -hmm. So when, when you're facing worry, don't worry about the event. Don't be concerned with the event. Be concerned with verifying if you should be scared or not. Okay? If you're scared, then act, you know, respond to it as fear. If you're not, then drop it altogether. Mm -hmm. right? uh, anxiety is more interesting because anxiety is not about the event in the future being less safe. It's about... I know there is an event in the future that is less safe and I've looked at my abilities and I doubt that I can deal with that. Mm. So anxiety is focused on your own abilities to deal with a scary event in the future. Okay. And so accordingly, when you feel anxiety, don't try to solve the problem that you're afraid of. Try to work on your skills. Mm. Try to ask yourself, do I actually not have the skills or do I? Have I ever been in situations like this where I thought I didn't have the skills, but I it turned out that I did? Or can I develop my skills? Yeah. Okay. Can I maybe delay the event by a week and develop my skills further if it's a presentation mm. or whatever? And then finally, panic. Panic is all about time. Yes. So we panic when the, when the stress or the threat is imminent. doesn't matter how big or small the threat is. It's now. It is approaching too quickly. Mm. And so once again, when you're panicking, don't work on the threat. Work on time. Right? Try to get yourself more time by cancelling other things that you're engaged in to give yourself more space to, to think or to, to, to develop, uh, you know, maybe try to delay the event that's coming or maybe try to verify maybe the time available is enough if you, you know, stayed Focus. up a couple of hours a day. Mm -hmm. Right. Finally, burnout and burnout is the most frequent reason to break in our world today. And burnout has nothing to do with the intensity of the of a single event that stresses you. Burnout is a collection of events. Uh, that keep repetitive, uh, repetitively affecting you with stress. So the, we, we burn out when uh, the multiplication of the number of stressors in our life, including silly stressors like my alarm in the morning is very loud, okay? Wow. Uh, multiplied by the intensity of each, okay? So your commute might stress you a little bit if it's 15 minutes, but it may stress you more if it's an hour, mm. right? Multiplied by the frequency of application, if you commute twice a day or six times a day or once a week, it's different, mm. multiplied by the duration of the application. So, you know, if, you're, if your boss is annoying, but you meet them, you know, once every other month, that's fine. But if they are sitting in the desk in front of you, applied to you eight hours a day, it's very stressful. Mm. And so when that, inc uh, you know, is higher than our ability to, uh, to handle the stress, to carry the stress, we break. Mm. Okay, and that's mostly why most of us now break. You burnout is everywhere in the corporate world, in the business world, in relationships, and everything, because none of the stressors that is attacking you is actually significant enough for you to say, "Oh, that's, you know, I should remove that." Yes. Right. 
you know, you don't think it's that this one on its own is going to break you. Mm. But it's that aggregation of all of them. And then there is one Compound last interest. throw, yeah. you know, and, and you, you know, you, you walk in and someone says hi and you go like, don't hi me. You know, that's too much. I can't deal with this anymore. And you break. Right. Yeah. And so what again, once once again, the choice when you're when you're approaching burnout is first to listen to your yes. body, to your emotions, to your mind, to your soul that are giving you signals to develop the skills that you need to deal with all of those stressors, but mainly to limit them, mm. mainly to limit them, mainly, you know, change your alarm. It doesn't have to be that loud. You know, find an alarm that starts with a couple of nice, you know, um, yoga sounds and then, you know, becomes a little more aggressive. Change your, you know, your commute. If you can't change it, at least get yourself a nice cup of coffee and music with you. Yeah. Right. And by reducing and limiting, uh, believe it or not, you know, burnout becomes very manageable, much mm. more manageable than people think if you start to pay attention to all of the little things. So one exercise I ask people to do is to just sit down and write all of the things that stressed you last week. And you'll probably find a hundred of them, you know, wow. that annoying friend that texts you at the wrong time, that, you know, uh, meeting that you, you, si you sit in every week, but, you know, benefit nothing from. Mm. And, and you can remove those from your life if you choose to. I love that. There, is, there are so many things in this podcast that I want to ask you more of, but we, this is probably the longest podcast I've ever done. <laughs> yes. And I would prefer to do a part two with you when I can have you in my studio. And Let's do that next we time. We not, have not been recording for four hours today yes, together. Yeah. But there was one thing that you said about, to, about Ali, that when he passed, he said, just before he passed, he said to your daughter, I feel that I was within everyone and everyone was around me. Is yeah, that right? Everywhere and part of everyone. Everywhere and part of everyone. And I'm going to talk to you when we finish about this season called Manifest. Mm. Have you been watching it? Have you watched it? Mm -mm. You're going to love I, it. I, want, I saw it yesterday on my TV. Actually. You're going to love it. And yeah. in that, they just say everything is connected. Tru truly, yeah. And everyone is connected. Truly. And I believe that the reason why I created my show is to connect us to share a story so you don't feel less alone, to inspire you to do something, to take action, Beautiful. to find a mentor, to have this conversation, to see how it can impact someone else. We are all connected and everyone right. you speak to will have gone through something similar in their life that you have. We just need to open up and have it. So thank you for opening up to me and connecting to me today. It's wonderful that I'm here. You're a wonderful person and your purpose and, and mission is wonderful. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you.